Hello, everyone. Welcome to the best named lecture, I think, ever, um, the boring lecture. So I'm Jody Guest. I'm the senior vice chair of the Department of Epidemiology. Um, and it is my pleasure to first introduce to you two of Dr. Boring's children, Annie and Michael Guest. Um, Annie and Michael Boring are here. My daughter's <laughs> Annie Guest. So <laughs> I just adopted you both. Yeah, sorry. Um, and so we're super thrilled to have um, two of his three children here. Um, Dr. Boring, for those of you who don't know, um, was the first department chair at, of epidemiology here at Rollins and is one of the founders of the school. Um, he came here a very long period of time ago, um, and I personally had the privilege of being taught by him. He was my department chair. Um, he taught my very first ever uh, class in epidemiology, and he's truly, the way he taught is truly the reason why I fell in love with epidemiology. We used to, as doctoral students, or as masters and doctoral students, laugh about his name um, because, of course, you don't think you're going to be taking a, a class from someone with the last name of Boring. Guest is also an awkward last name for students a lot of times. Um, but he was anything but boring. He was infectious. He was an infectious disease epidemiologist, but he was truly infectious in the way he talked about epidemiology. He taught the course I now love to teach, Epi 530. I don't think it even had that name at the time or that course number. Um, but it's such a privilege to be able to teach from what he started um, in my life and really see um, you know, how you can hopefully model the form of teaching that he had. Um, he was well known for he only ever wore blue. Um, he, although his children did not wear the right color today, <laughs> um, nor did I. Uh, he always had his left arm rolled, um, sleeve rolled up because he wrote on the chalkboard or the whiteboard all the time. And we did have chalkboards back then at some, in some rooms. Um, he was dynamic. He was convinced that epidemiologists could change the world. He was convinced that Rollins would help change the world. He was convinced that everyone needed to pay a ton of attention to a denominator. And if you didn't listen to the, what the denominator was and think about what was in it, you were misleading in what you did with epidemiology. Um, and he was convinced that, um, that truly this was the path forward to better health for people. So um, in 2020, the Department of Epidemiology voted to name an infectious disease lecture in his honor. We, of course, then didn't get to have one because we began a pandemic. Um, and so we were lucky last year to officially roll out the boring lecture in our department and then when Grand Rounds came back to the school um, and there was a conversation about having um, these Grand Rounds and what would an ID one be like, we were thrilled to offer up the Boring Lecture to the whole school and share it with everyone. Again, Dr. Boring wasn't just our department's gem. He was a gem in the school and, um, and at the whole university. He won award after award after award for his teaching. He was the uh, faculty professor of the year here at Rollins five years. He also won all the highest awards at all of Emory. So really, truly a lauded professor. So it is my privilege then to turn from Dr. Boring and the reason we've named this lecture to introducing you to Dr. Lauren Ansel Myers. Um, I don't know her as well, so I'm gonna have to actually read some stuff about her where I could talk about Dr. Boring for a long time. Um, so let me get to this. So uh, Dr. Ansel Myers comes to us from the full eclipse yesterday in Austin, Texas. She is a professor and the Cooley Centennial Professor in Biology, Population Health, and Statistics at the University of Texas in Austin. I think one of the really exciting things about Dr. Ansel Myers' work is um, she was very much called on during co the COVID-19 pandemic to do a lot of forecasting and modeling and help with prevention plans. Additionally, when um, CDC put out the call for the new outbreak analytics groups, her group in UT Austin is one of the groups that, that joined that's now called InsightNet. Um, and SIDMAP from Emory is also one of those sites. So there's a real connection between her work and what's being done here at Rollins. So we are thrilled to have you here. I will give you a few more accolades. Um, she was named as one of the top 100 global innovators under the age of 35 by the MIT Technology Review in 2004 and received the Joseph Lieberman Award for Significant Contributions in Science in 2017. So we're thrilled to have you here. We're thrilled to have you giving our boring lecture. Well, 
I am really honored to be here giving the lecture in your father's name. He sounds like a, an inspiration who impacted a lot, of, a lot of you who are in this room, either directly or, or indirectly. Um, so I am going to um, start my lecture by telling you about uh, an experience that I had here at Emory that really was the beginning of the journey that's going to end with what I'm going to tell you about it with, with COVID. Um, so I came to Emory in 2000. I made a beeline here from finishing my PhD to work with Dr. Bruce Levin to learn from him how to combine experiments with bacteria and phage with modeling to try to understand how pathogens evolve and spread under complex conditions. And while I was working in his lab, um, some epidemiologists came down the road from the CDC looking for some mathematical modeling help. They were looking for someone to help them build models to investigate how better to control outbreaks of walking pneumonia in closed residential settings, so mycoplasma pneumonia. And I, I said, I'd love to help you do this. I don't really know that much about modeling epidemics, but I'll learn. And so I learned about the problem. I started learning about the traditional way of uh, modeling epidemics, these compartmental models that assume that everyone in populations are fully mixed. We're all coming in contact with each other, and we all have about the same rate of contact on a daily basis. And I was banging my head against it. How do I apply these, what we call mass action models, to these very structured populations? And at the same time, so this is around the year 2000, um, social network theory was just emerging as a really quantitative and exciting discipline. In fact, I don't know, you know, this is, this is old news these days, but in, it was in 1998, Duncan Watson, Steve Strogatz came out with their groundbreaking paper on collective dynamics of small world networks that was published in Nature. I think it now has over 50,000 citations. And I had this idea that we could apply some of these network theoretic tools, these mathematical ways of representing context between humans um, to studying epidemic spread. And, and that's what I did. And working together with, um, with ep epidemiologists at the CDC, we wrote some of the very early network epidemiology papers. We, this is a, this is a uh, diagram of one of the populations we were looking at. It was a, a psychiatric institution that had an outbreak of walking pneumonia. What you see is that um, residents were living in wards. They had very little contact between wards. Uh, and there were caregivers that were working in, in, with these different groups of residents. And what we learned when we, when we applied the math of networks was that we, we could actually sort of explain something that had seemed mysterious. You had uh, outbreak data that looked something like this. A bunch of residents got sick, right? And it was really hard to understand what was driving those dynamics and how could we more effectively intervene to slow these kind of outbreaks. And what we realized uh, in studying this, because mycoplasma pneumonia is a, is a bacteria that uh, can spread asymptomatically and presymptomatically, that what was probably going on is that you had asymptomatic or presymptomatic, just a few caregivers that turned out to be vectors that were moving it from one side of the facility to the other. So shortly after that, I moved to UT to start my job as a, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, I got a call. I think this was maybe 2003. Um, this was back when we used to get calls on our landline. I pick up the phone. And the person on the other end of the phone says, this is Babak Corbelo. I'm calling you from the British Columbia Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in, uh, in Vancouver. And um, I read your paper about walking pneumonia. And we have this new virus. We just had our first case of this new virus, SARS. And we think we need to model the network of contact patterns in Vancouver to understand how this thing is going to spread and how we can stop it. And um, that really started my journey, my professional journey, in building models for really practical applications, for planning for and responding to emerging uh, pandemic threats like SARS-1, like SARS-2, like H1N1, et cetera. Um, so now fast forwarding. Um, I spent the 20 years leading up to the um, COVID pandemic, like I said, building models and building tools to help equip public health agencies uh, for pandemics like COVID. What you see here is a picture of one of my former graduate students, um, who many of you know who are in my field, Sam Scarpino. He is demoing a, um, a, a simulation tool we built for the state of Texas so they could simulate pandemics as part of their preparedness exercises. They could specify how deadly, how fast it spread, they could press pause, they could deploy vaccines, and they could see it unfold through the lens of a very noisy surveillance system. So here he is back in, I don't know, 2011 or something, demoing it to, um, to other scientists and, and officials from the CDC and the NIH. 
During that sort of era of pandemic planning, when we were working with the state of Texas, so this was after the 2009 pandemic and before COVID, we built a lot of online decision support tools. We built some planning tools to help them figure out how many ventilators they should stockpile all around Texas to plan for the next pandemic. Uh, when you have a really complicated, fast-paced vaccine rollout, uh, where do you set up your pods and who do you prioritize and how do you make sure you're getting it to underserved communities? Um, and another tool to help them figure out exactly what pharmacy chains and specific pharmacies in the state they should use to make sure that especially they were serving underinsured populations and getting them access to diagnostic tests and antivirals and vaccines. So we built all these tools and in 2019, just before the pandemic, we started a project for the CDC where we were gonna scale up some of these tools. We were making a national version of that Texas simulation tool that I showed you earlier. And we were gonna work on some of these optimization problems. How do we have, make sure we're optimally prepared for the next pandemic? We started this project in 2019 and we were only partway through it when COVID emerged. And um, like many of you in the field, we just dropped what we were doing, right? And we, and fortunately we, were, we didn't totally drop it. We were sort of equipped to pivot some of our models towards the emerging threat. And, um, and we started getting requests immediately for analytic support, for expert support. We started getting requests from our own university and our kids' schools, from our city authorities, from our state authorities, et cetera. Um, and, and the demand for modeling was fast and furious. And here's one of the more memorable requests for modeling support that we and I think maybe a half dozen or a dozen other research groups who do modeling got from around the world. This was a urgent modeling request from Ambassador Burks and, uh, and her team. She had just come into the position of running the White House Coronavirus Task Force. This is what it said. This will be a time sensitive and urgent request. Below, please see the series of parameters and outcomes we would like you to model. We will need whatever results you can achieve by the close of business Wednesday East Coast U.S. time or opening of business on Thursday, your results in that time frame will inform U.S. policies. Okay, this was Tuesday, right? <laughs> so, so, I mean, they were asking us to do an amount of work in 24 hours, and we are lucky if we can, you know, get done in six months or eight months. And so, but, but we all did, right? The groups around the world, we, we went as fast as we could. We gave whatever projections we could. And I'll talk a little bit more about the projections in a minute. Um, so we did, I think we delivered some projections maybe by Thursday morning. And I will tell you, they did not inform US policy. <laughs> anyway, okay, so that, but that was a demand. And so we were getting all these requests. And so what did we do at, at that time? My research group was about the size it was for 20 years, which was, I think I had maybe four graduate students working with me and maybe a postdoc. And, and so there was no way we could respond to all this, but, but all these requests. And so what we did is we banded together. I formed something called the COVID-19 Modeling Consortium people in, from different disciplines around the University of Texas, where a very large university found me. We had engineers and we had computer scientists, we had social scientists all saying, how can we help? We know you're doing this modeling, we know you're doing this work. And then, and then collaborators for you know, decades, we, we reached out to each other and we, we convened through Zoom on a daily basis. We would, uh, we would, these requests would come in and we would sort of self-organize and do as much analysis as quickly as possible. Um, in order, to, in order to provide whatever decision support and situational awareness we could. Now, we ultimately got funding from NIH and CDC and NSF as supplements to existing grants, but those took a lot of time to process. We'd done a lot of the work before we actually got the funding, but what allowed us to really launch quickly and get the admin support and, and hire back a few modelers who had gone off to industry was a $2 million gift from Tito's Vodka. So. <laughs> Tito's, which is an Austin-based company, reached out to the university and said, how can we help? And they gave, they gave some funding for us to help with the forecasting. They funded my colleague, Jason McClellan, who identified the spike protein, who I think accelerated the development of the vaccines by probably three months or more, thanks to his research. And they converted their vodka-making factories into um, hand uh, sanitizer factories. So, so they did a lot on the local front to help. And really, we're so grateful, because they, without them, we would not have been able to um, put so much sort of time and effort and, and, and find the people and the um, resources we need to do the work we did. Okay, so um, what kind of work did we do? Uh, well, we built lots of dashboards. We had dashboards forecasting COVID hospitalizations in Austin and 23 different cities and regions of Texas. We had dashboards that 
provided guidance about how dangerous it was to open schools at a county level across the United States. We look closely at Austin at the zip code level at um, uh, hospitalization rates and death rates and uh, vaccination uptake rates and correlated that with social vulnerability. Um, we did many, many, many consultations. Sometimes it was just jumping on a Zoom for 15 minutes to help kind of interpret data or, or provide some kind of scientific uh, support. Um, and we, we published dozens of rapid reports, most of which never saw the light of day in terms of peer-reviewed publications. But why did, why did we actually put them in a report and put them on our website? Because um, a lot of times we were consulting with, and by consulting, I mean, this is nothing we're paid for. This is just you know, informal conversations, serving on task force, just uh, kind of lending guidance. A lot of times the stakeholders that were, were taking our advice or, or learning or listening to us, what we, had, what we had to say about the data or uh, the models, they needed a track record. They needed to be able to point to, here's the study. This is the reason we decided to close schools. Here's the study. This is the reason we decided to use testing in this way on this campus. And so we, we gave them some documentation so that they could, they could have some kind of paper trail for that. OK, so what I want to do with the rest of my time is I'm going to take you on a little tour of uh, some of the uh, studies and rapid analysis that we did during the first year and a half of the COVID pandemic. Um, and I'm organizing them around what I think of as the three major goals of mathematical modeling of outbreaks. One is modeling to help us understand the threat, characterize how a pathogen is spreading, how deadly it is, what, what, um, what populations are at risk, et cetera. The second is to forecast the threat. Once we have a handle on its characteristics, we might be able to say something about where it will be tomorrow or next week or next month. And then finally, using mathematical modeling to help people make decisions about how to use limited resources or when to enact measures that might be socioeconomically costly. So I'll give you a couple examples from each of these categories. So first, I'm going to tell you about the first two analyses that we did in my group, um, starting within 24 hours of hearing on the news that there was an anomalous virus infecting people in Wuhan, China, possibly associated with food markets. And at that point in time, if you'll remember, we didn't know if it was spreading from person to person. We didn't know if it was spreading very quickly. We had no idea how many people were already infected in China. And we didn't trust the data that were coming out of China. But we wanted to do our best to try to answer this question. So what data did we trust, did we look at, to, to try to answer those questions? Well, by the time we sort of got into the study, there had been 19 cases reported outside of China, the first one in Bangkok, but very quickly there was a case in Seattle and a case in, in Chicago. We had global air travel data, so we knew on a typical day how many people were flying in and out of Wuhan from every major uh, city in the world. And we also, through a collaboration with Chinese researchers, had um, GPS cell phone data from about 100 million people in China that, that gave us a way to approximate daily air, rail, and ground travel from uh, throughout China, so from Wuhan to about 300 other cities in China. So we use this data to sort of triangulate, to try to figure out how much COVID is there in Wuhan and how fast is it spreading. So how, how do we do that? Well, you know, we imagine that in Wuhan there's this outbreak and it's probably growing exponentially. And you think about these people who are traveling to every city every day is like sampling from that population. And so we know many, many people flew from Wuhan uh, over the last couple of weeks, and 19 of them um, were infected. And we knew the dates that they, they traveled, et cetera. So from that, we could try to infer how fast the virus was spreading in Wuhan. And what did we estimate? How far had it already spread? Well, by the time that Wuhan closed down on January 21st, and we, we made these projections around January 10th, by the time that Wuhan closed down on January 21st, 22nd, China had reported 425 cases total in Wuhan, and they've never updated that. We estimated that, in fact, by that time, there were probably around 12,000 cases in Wuhan. And this was a very rapid estimation, but, but after the fact, there were other sources of data, other retrospective analyses, and pretty much all of them have converged on probably somewhere between 10 and 15,000 people already infected by the time they closed down. And we also estimated from that Chinese mobility data that by the time of the Wuhan lockdown, when there had only been cases reported in Wuhan, there were probably cases in at least 100 other cities around China. And sure enough, within weeks, that you know, those projections were borne out. 
The second study I want to mention, and this is the only other one I'm going to talk about in the category, in the category of characterizing the threat, is a study we, we, we started and completed you know, within days of that first study. And um, this was a study to answer the question of how fast uh, was this virus spreading from person to person. And at that point in time, we knew it was related to SARS-1 from 2003, and I think we were all kind of hoping that we could contain it using the same kind of measures that were used to successfully contain SARS in 2003. So SARS-1, when somebody got infected, it took them about a week or eight days until they started spreading, started having symptoms, and they weren't actually contagious until they had symptoms, right? And so that like gives us time to kind of stop an outbreak in its tracks through really intensive contact tracing and isolation and quarantine. We were hoping that we would have time on our side with this new virus as well. So what we, want, what we set out to do is estimate something called the serial interval. The serial interval is the following, and I know most of you in this room probably know this, but if I get infected and then I infect somebody else, it's the number of days between me first feeling symptoms and that person first feeling symptoms. Okay, so it gives us a sense of the pace of transmission from one generation to the next, okay? So we just wanted to estimate what is that. And we worked with a, a team of Chinese students who scoured the websites of uh, public health departments in 18 different provinces in China, looking for case reports that had been put online that provided the following information. The date um, uh, uh, an individual first reported symptoms, and they'd done some epidemiological investigation, they had a good idea of who probably infected them, and the date that that infector first started having symptoms. So from that, you can get the, I can get the serial interval for that one transmission event. So amazingly, these students were able to dig up between 400 and 450 case reports that actually had good guesses for what that serial interval is. And really all we did, besides just kind of cleaning up the data a little bit, and you know, they translated for us, really all we did was we made a histogram. So that's what you see here, the distribution of serial intervals across about 400 and 450 uh, cases in China. And uh, what we found was really, just looking at this was super alarming. So what are the alarming things? Well, number one, the average serial interval was about four days. So it was spreading at about twice, as, twice the rate of SARS-1, right? So that was kind of, that was very alarming. Number two, sort of alarming, there's some people who don't transmit for quite a long time. And, um, and so that means we're gonna have to isolate people and quarantine people for quite a long time. But really the most alarming thing was these negative serial intervals, right? That means, and we all know this now, but that means that people were actually spreading the virus before they themselves had symptoms. And so we sent this to our program officers, our colleagues at the CDC, and they looked at this and they said, go back and check your math, this can't be true. And it wasn't, I don't think it was because they didn't trust us, but I think there was just such, we couldn't believe in this moment that we were dealing with something that was so speedy and so stealthy. But within days, there was corroborating data from China, and we knew that, and, and this was really, this was the nail in the coffin. As soon as we saw this, we knew that this was going to become a global pandemic, and there was absolutely nothing we could do to stop it. Despite the fact that we all knew this, it took our hospitals filling in New York for us all in the United States to actually do anything about it to prepare. Okay, so that was my two, those are my two examples of uh, analysis we did early on to characterize the threat. We also did some early analysis to using data from China to try to estimate how, how useful social distancing interventions were at slowing spread as, as the virus was emerging in different cities and, and other things like that. So forecasting the threat. So forecasting is probably, of these three, the, the activity we do that gets the most public attention, that has the most public interest. You know, you guys might have been visiting forecasting websites by IHME or maybe CDC or, um, or other uh, well-known forecasting groups. And so I'm not gonna say too much about it because I think people are somewhat familiar with it, but I, I will tell you just a few uh, vignettes. So first of all, getting back to the request from the White House Coronavirus Task Force. One of the first things they asked us to do was to forecast, so this was, you know, I think March of 2020 or February, I can't remember, how many people were gonna die from COVID in the United States in 2020. So, you know, like a 10 month or a nine month projection. And we said, well, we can't possibly forecast that because it totally depends on policies and people and so many things we don't know, but we'll give you some scenario projections, right? These are sort of counterfactuals, if thens. If this happens, then this is what we project. And so we, we gave them a bunch and they sort of boiled down to this. If we don't do anything to control its spread, 
well over a million people will die by the end of 2020. 2020. If we completely lock down or we find a way to really curtail spread, we might be able to limit deaths to under 50,000 in the United States. And if we do something in between, it will be somewhere in between. And, and that is the roller coaster that we rode in 2020, closing down, opening up, closing down, opening up. And as many of you probably remember, there were about 350,000 uh, deaths reported by the end of 2020. And look, you know, a more kind of um, closer look using um, uh, excess mortality calculations estimated that there were probably a little bit over a half million deaths in 2020. So those are the very first scenario projections. But then we uh, got on the bandwagon of trying to make as data-driven short-term forecasts as we possibly could, first starting with forecasting mortality and then moving on to forecasting hospital healthcare demand, hospital admissions, ICU demand. Um, and it was, it was really challenging uh, because even though we had been working in the, on flu forecasting and other kinds of outbreak forecasting, we were in this unprecedented situation where all the assumptions in our models about how people move and interact with each other went out the window. People were staying home, then they were not staying home, then they were doing this and they were doing that. And so, so what did we do to adapt to this new world? Well, we, we integrated um, cell phone mobility data into our forecasts. Um, so we, and, and this data was provided very early on for free to researchers from SafeGraph and then later by Google and by Apple. Um, but we could see on a daily basis, um, almost in real time with a little, maybe a week lag, uh, this is probably from Austin, I'm showing you here, how many hours per day the, the average person in the sample is staying at home? How many trips they're taking per day to restaurants, to bars, to grocery stores, to parks, to doctor's offices? And you can see, this is, this is 2020, you can see everything drops off. In April, when we have a stay-at-home order, time at home goes way up, and then it starts to kind of wiggle around as we start to come out of our, our homes again. And so we use that as a real-time indicator of how much contact there was between people, how, many, how much opportunity there was for transmission, and we incorporated those into our forecasts. Now, you know, four years later, um, we for, the forecasting enterprise, not just by my group, but by a, a large community of researchers around the world, has really matured a lot. We are one of many groups, you know, a dozen or more, that provide weekly forecasts to the CDC's forecasting hub of um, COVID hospital admissions at the state and national level, of uh, influenza hospital admissions at the state and national level, and, and kind of in beta version RSV as well. Okay, so finally, I'm gonna turn to the third and uh, final goal, which is arguably the most sort of directly impactful type of analysis we do, and that is Modeling to help support decision making. Modeling to help with really sometimes you know minute decisions about how to intervene. Um, so let me tell you a little bit. This is a beautiful picture of Austin, um, and what I'm mostly I'm going to talk almost exclusively about is work that we did locally at home to support Austin in navigating, uh, understanding, and responding to the threat. So this is a nice picture of Austin. We faced you know some very early challenges because Austin is a city of mass gatherings. We love our sports. We love our music uh, events, and in fact, one of the first major decisions made to kind of shut down a, a social event was the decision of, of Austin to cancel the South by Southwest Festival in March of 2020. So it was canceled just a little bit before everyone shut down. Um, and then this is a picture of Austin. This is the, you know, what you may not know about Austin, but this is a picture of Austin with, that is colored according to racial ethnic majority by census tract. Um, yellow means uh, Latino majority. The darker the yellow, the bigger the majority. Blue means white majority. Uh, green indicates black majority, and pink indicates Asian majority. And you can see we are a very segregated city, and, um, and in general, East Austin tends to be more vulnerable, poorer than, than West Austin. And I just added this, just so you know, we're also, we were also on the path of the eclipse, so <laughs> lots, of, lots of reasons to come to Austin. Those are uh, my parents and sisters who all. And that is actually a picture from my backyard of, uh, of the Equestrian Show. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Okay. So anyway, so Austin. So let's getting back to COVID. So who made the decisions in Austin? Well, Austin, I think, had a pretty unique structure for a major city. And you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, our metro area was you know, already over 2 million. So we're a pretty good-sized city. So we, there was actually a COVID executive task force that met daily and then you know three times a week sometimes four times a week sometimes twice a week for almost two years and collectively made decisions and the people on that task force were our elected officials our mayor and our elected county judge texas is a home rule state 
The seat of authority when it comes to emergencies lies with the elected county judges. So at the end of the day, besides the governor, they made the decisions. They can close schools. They can close businesses. So it was really interesting because the decisions were actually made jointly between the mayor and the judge. But, but the authority uh, lied with the, the elected um, judges. Uh, we had leaders of our public health department and EMS. Um, we had executives from the, from the three major hospital systems that served the Austin area. And then we had a bunch of scientists and doctors. And this was really facilitated by uh, the first dean of UT's new, relatively new med school, Clay Johnston. He was you know, immediately tapped by the city leaders and he brought all the scientists that he could to the table and they were very receptive. So um, there were some difficult moments. The for-profit hospital systems didn't always see eye to eye with the uh, leadership of the city or public health leadership or, or even the scientists, but they worked through it together respectfully, uh, always looking to science and data to, to try to figure out what was going on and to make decisions. Um, that doesn't mean that politics and people didn't, didn't sometimes influence the decisions, but they always gave it a look. They always gave it a thought. Okay, so they led with science from day one. This is from KXAN News, one of our local stations, um, when on March 24th, when the mayor announced the stay home work safe order, he asked us if we could repurpose one of the graphs we had shown them privately about what would happen if we didn't, sh if we didn't close down asked if they could repurpose it and kind of put a stylized version out in the news, and we did. And what this is, is like, you, you probably saw forecasts like this when you were back in March. Blue was our hospital capacity in Austin. Red was what was gonna happen if we didn't do anything. Um, and you know, you can see there's no actual numbers there. It's just meant to be sort of qualitative. And then the next one is if we managed to reduce our contacts by 50%, by 75% or 90% reduction in contacts. And you know, that was just language we found back in March on the fly, right? But that's how we were thinking about it, to try to communicate to people that you know, it, it wasn't about how many people would die, but if we wanna maintain the integrity of our healthcare system and we don't want our hospitals to look like New York and Italy, we needed to do something pretty drastic. So they came out with that. They asked our group to, um, uh oh, this is, so this is a little politics. So, um, Austin locked down and you know, only essential workers were allowed to go to work, or, um, uh, except then the governor came in and said, uh, construction industry is, is an essential industry. Construction workers have to be allowed to go to work. And Austin public health and Austin leadership was very worried about our construction workforce. They, they didn't feel it was an essential workforce. Um, it's a very vulnerable community for lots of reasons. And so they asked us to estimate what the, what the risks would be to that workforce, to that population, and also um, what the potential spillover risks were to the rest of the community. And so we did some very rapid modeling. We made some estimates and we projected that construction workers would be about fivefold more likely to end up hospitalized with COVID than other people in similar age groups in some, but different occupational classes. We forecasted it. There wasn't a lot they could do about it because the governor's order superseded the local restrictions. And, but what they did do was they started to track occupation in hospital admissions, and we, we kept an eye on it. And, for, and unfortunately, by August of 2020, um, construction workers were almost exactly five times as likely to end up in the hospital as other people in the same age group. So that was one where we could project it, but they weren't able to do much about it. Um, they asked us to estimate how many uh, isolation rooms they would need to protect the population experiencing homelessness during uh, a major wave. And we actually had an undergraduate who did that, that work for the city very quickly. And they ended up procuring, I think we recommended 200 hotel rooms because the hotels weren't being used as isolation facility, and they did. And at the peak, I think about 180 were occupied. So it was really actually very useful for the city and sort of uh, effective resource allocation. Okay, this is the last thing I really wanna focus on. We spent a little more time focusing on it. I think one of the keys to Austin's success was what you see on the screen. It was a staged alert system that guided policymaking, guided risk awareness by both decision makers and the public. So what do you, this is actually a screenshot from Austin Public Health's website. Um, it, what it shows here is it shows a time series of um, daily hospital admissions. It's actually a seven day rolling average, but it's about how many people are newly admitted to the hospital for COVID. And those, those different color swaths indicate uh, what level of restrictions we're under. 
red is like, if we get to red, we got to stay home. If we get to green or, or blue, which we didn't get to for like years, um, we get to kind of really loosen up. And, and orange and red are in between. I'm sorry, orange and yellow are in between. Okay, and then there's a bunch of other numbers tracking all sorts of things. So, so we helped Austin to design that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but, but, but one reason I think this was very successful in, um, in helping uh, decision makers make decisions, helping the public understand risks, and especially in cultivating adherence to recommendations is because our city leaders socialized the heck out of it. They were on social media, they were in the news, every kind of news media you could imagine on almost a daily basis talking about what number our hospital admissions are, how close are we to that next threshold of 20 admissions, how many more days, why we need to tighten up, why we can loosen up, how long we expect to stay in there. So you see all sorts of, that was our, uh, that was our um, public health authority, this is our mayor, this is the second public health authority, our mayor again, and those are just newscasters. The newscasters were talking about what alert stage we're in. So it really became part of like the daily discussion in the city. You know, you talk to people, what color are we? I talk to schools. If we go into orange, we're going to do this. If we go into white, yellow, we're going to do this. And so they, they, they developed it, they stuck with it, they socialized it, and it really helped. And, I'll, and I will come back to how much it helped in a minute. Okay, so how did we design this? Um, well, we took a very kind of data-driven engineering approach to this. First, we said, okay, th this, was, this was, we designed this in April. We were in a lockdown. And uh, we knew that Trump had already announced that he was going to do the reopening of America. And uh, Governor Abbott announced that uh, Texas was going to be one of the most enthusiastic states to embrace it. Okay, so we knew things were about to open up. And we also knew that nothing had changed. This thing was still deadly. This thing was still highly transmissible. And so, so the leadership was like, well, we, we need to know when we need to lock down if, once we open up because we're going to be forced to open up. And so we, we said, okay, we, we can try to design an alert system to help you know when you should tap on the brakes, when you need to slam on the brakes. But if we're going to design a policy for you, we need to know what your goals are. What are you trying to achieve with this alert system? Is it just letting people know what the risks are? Is it making decisions that are going to have some impact? What is it? And although I think many people in that room said, well, we'd like a system that saves as many lives as possible, if that were your only goal, you would just be locked down. Right, and so, and it's also not a goal that was necessarily politically tractable at the time. So we came up with two very clear goals that we felt like everyone would agree with and were a good thing to anchor the system on. The first was a public health goal, and that was to keep hospitals under capacity, to ensure that we are with 95% confidence that, you, that Austin will never have a day where there's more people that need an IC, ICU care than we have uh, resources for. So keep hospitals under capacity. And then number two, avoid stay-home orders. Spend as little time as possible in red. Spend as little time as possible in orange. Spend more time in yellow. And, you know, and so what does that mean? That means we wanted multiple stages so we can kind of tap on the brakes to avoid having to slam on the brakes for a long period of time. So we, we built a model of COVID spreading, a pretty detailed model of COVID spreading through Austin. In the model, we actually had a staged alert system. So when hospitalizations got to certain levels, we would simulate a policy changing so it reduced the transmission rate in the city. And then when it got back down below, our model would simulate, it starts to spread faster again, right? And so, so we have a model of COVID in the city, we have a model that includes these stages, and then we use, um, sort of fancy optimization methods. We run the model you know, hundreds of thousands of times, each time with different thresholds, and we solve for which thresholds meet our two goals, which thresholds ensure that we're not gonna exceed capacity, but guarantee us the shortest amount of time in red, and, and a short amount of time in orange. And so there are a couple papers that describe the approach, um, and this is an example of a, a simulation. Um, the, the red dots were the actual data up to October of 2020, and then the lines going off to the right show this a bunch of simulated trajectories of what would happen if we actually let COVID spread under the stage alert system you see there with the red there, the yellow there. And so the reason you're seeing these waves is because we are, we're hitting different policies that are slowing the transmission that increase the transmission. So we did that. And the question is, did the policy work? So first of all, like I'm just gonna go back to, the policy worked pretty well, but 
partly because we did a really, we designed it very rigorously, but more because the local leaders bought into it and, and, and got the public to buy into it. So did the policy work? Well, this is um, a time series of actual ICU admissions in the Austin area. And the policy was designed to ensure that we never exceeded 200 in the whole Austin area. That, is, that was our capacity, 200 uh, staffed ICU beds. And um, so we followed the policy, and this is showing you through April 2022. And we did have to go into three stage five periods. And they sort of worked. This was our delta wave. Um, and we, we exceeded capacity, although we made capacity, we made room for it. But, um, but, I, but it's actually a little bit because of user error, error in the sense that we hit orange and we didn't pivot to orange for a couple of weeks. We didn't do anything, we sort of waited. Um, but anyway, it worked pretty well in terms of keeping our peaks under our capacity. And then in terms of the socioeconomic goal, did we manage to avoid being in these lockdowns for long periods of time? It's a little hard to know what to compare it to. The one thing we can compare it to is that in the state of Texas, whenever hosp uh, ICUs were 15% filled with COVID, it automatically triggered a governor's order to shut bars and limit restaurant capacity. And Austin spent the least amount of time under those governor restrictions compared to all other major cities in Texas. So we went into red later and we came out earlier. It's something, right? Okay, so the policy worked and we were certainly not the only city, state, country, school, campus to build a staged alert system. This is a screenshot of me Googling COVID alert systems, the COVID alert levels. And there are hundreds of these developed, again, by all these different types of jurisdictions and entities. And when you dig deep and when you look at them a little bit closely, most of them did not stand the test of time. Most of them were in place for maybe a few months. Very few have any rationale for them, right? They, why did they pick these numbers? Why are they tracking these data? Um, why are they changing when they're changing? Some are a little bit more, were, you know, more clearly developed based on good rationale. Um, and we actually simulated a few of these to say, we're, you know, if we had used your system in Austin, would that have worked for us? Or what is the difference between your system? Are you triggering later? Are you triggering earlier? A couple examples are Harvard's Global Health Institute. They came out with one of the first widely used stage alert systems. Many schools, many businesses, uh, some public health departments used it to decide what, uh, to, to inform their communications and their policies. But what we found is if you use these levels, and this is a very early one, it would be way too conservative. You'd spend way more time in red and orange than you needed to if your goal, again, was to ensure hospital capacity. And then the, the, the country of France's sort of whack-a-mole policy where they would shut down cities as their ICUs hit certain levels was too liberal. They were shutting down too late, and so the ICUs would be full for longer than they needed to be. So, you know, there really is... The fact that, there, that everyone was sort of gravitating to these stage alert system means there's a real, there's sort of a, a human need for it, right? Like it helps us think about things. It helps us translate very quantitative things into uh, you know, discrete things where we can make decisions. We can, and so there's, there's a real need for it. I think certainly as we're thinking about future threats, there's a need for being able to develop this in a, in a rigorous and effective way very rapidly. So let me just close by saying modeling helped to protect Austin. There's a lot of other things that helped to protect Austin, right? Good decision making, a relatively young and healthy population. But when we look back and we compare COVID mortality in Austin, these are major metro counties of Austin, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, El Paso, and Texas's um, average per capita COVID mortality. This goes through April 2022. Austin had less than half the per capita mortality of the state as a whole and significantly lower than all the other major cities. When you compare Austin's major metro county to the four closest sized cities in the country, uh, Sacramento, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Las Vegas, you see a similar trend. Um, and you know, again, less than half the US per capita average. I think there's a lot we can learn when we just compare US cities and what their COVID experience is. What worked, what didn't, why did people die at the rate they did, when they did? Are there things we can learn in planning for the new, next pandemic? So what are some of the lessons learned? I, I know we've all thought a lot about this, but in my, my narrow world, some of the really important lessons learned were we spent years building decision support tools to help the state of Texas prepare for the next pandemic, mostly in the first five years after the 2009 pandemic. COVID emerged, and even though the state, I can't remember, maybe they invested a million dollars in having us develop those and put them on the web, they'd forgotten about them. 
They had no idea how to use them, but they were facing the exact same questions. How many ventilators, where? Which pharmacies, how, right? And so how do, the, the lesson learned is that we didn't do a good job of building sustainable tools and training people to use them and make sure they were ready to use. So how do we, as a community of modelers and public health experts and epidemiologists, how do we build useful analytic and forecasting tools that will stand the test of time, that will be ready if we're fortunate enough not to see a pandemic for you know, a good decade or so, that will be ready and usable in real time. The other thing, and this is a quote uh, that appeared in the New York Times, they interviewed a bunch of people who were working on the pandemic uh, about lessons for the next pandemic. What have we learned? But I mean, they asked us this six months into the pandemic, so there was a still a lot more to be learned. But, uh, but at the time I said, we must overcome our collective failure of imagination. COVID took us by surprise. We spent decades planning for a pandemic that would resemble viruses we'd already seen, we already knew. We didn't plan for face masks, mass testing, stay home orders, politicized decision making or devastating racial disparities, and we have to prepare for a broader range of threats. And so I'm working in my, so where, what are we doing now in my group? We're working on both of these things, overcoming our failure of imagination and trying to build more robust tools for the future. Um, I co-founded a nonprofit that's based in Austin, but it has people working all, all over the world, called CAPTURS, the Center for Advanced Preparedness Threat Response Simulation. And what we're doing is we're actually making games. We're, we're using best practices for military war gaming and simulation games to make games to help um, decision makers of all types, professionals of all types, to think through um, scenarios for future pandemics that may look very different than um, than pandemics and outbreaks we've seen in the past, forces them to engage with different, different kinds of uncertain data to make decisions, to make situational assessments. And then, um, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we were fortunate, along with Emory, to be one of the 13 awardees in the CFA's new InsightNet, which is a project to build robust analytic tools and to train uh, public health um, professionals to use them in their daily operations and to be able to use them um, as in when the next threat emerges. So with that, I just want to acknowledge the many people that were involved in our, in our COVID work and, and the things I described to you today, and, and thank you so much for having me.